He brought me here to bring a sense of loneliness to the life of a swimmer. But sometimes, you know, God allow our physical circumstances uh, to bring us to the reason why He wants us to have the burden. I will never forget when I read about Fanny Crosby, the blind singer, who one day a minister went to her and asked her, what is or what was the greatest desire of the heart? And this man was expecting her to say that before she died that she would be able to see. And her response to him was that her greatest desire is that she would be blind for the rest of her life. And this man was so absolutely taken back that he almost couldn't believe that. And he turned to her and said, uh, why is it that you say that? And she made a statement. She said, I've got a tremendous advantage over you. She said, you realize that the very first person that I will ever focus my eyes upon is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And this was a tremendous advantage. And you know, my brother and sister, I think there are so many of us as God's people, when it comes to the reason why God wants to give us a burden, if it's a physical reason, there are so many of us who are going to sit in a corner, we begin to sacrifice for ourselves, we feel so sorry for ourselves, and at the end of the day, we can't mean a thing for God. I mentioned this afternoon about Charles Adam Spurgeon. You know, Spurgeon went through uh, terrible spells of depression. And some reckon that one of the reasons why uh, Charles Adam Spurgeon went for those, through those depression sessions, was because of the fact that he suffered from gout. In fact, some Sunday mornings when Spurgeon was preaching, he was in such pain that he was, uh, that he put his knee in a chair and he was standing on his one feet because of a tremendous pain that he went through. But uh, it's a well-known fact. But Spurgeon did not allow that uh, to bring him to the place of self-pity. But he allowed those circumstances uh, to bring him to the place where God gave him a reason to have a tremendous burden. I'm saying that tonight because I think it's possible that there are some of us here in this gathering. And maybe God has given you or has allowed you to have some, some physical discomfort. And my brother and sister... God wants us to use those so that we can be able to come, become effective for Him. You remember the Apostle Paul? That marvelous verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9, when he said, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is my perfect and weakness. Most rather, therefore, will I glorify in my infirmities, so that the strength of the grace and the power would be able to rest upon me. So there was a physical reason why she had a burden to seek in the face of God. But my friends, there was a social reason. She was in very difficult circumstances. She was in a family situation where her husband had another wife. She had children of her own. And Anna found herself in a very, very difficult situation. Times when she was laughed at. Times when she was mocked at. And those reasons gave her a burden <coughs> to seek the face of God. But you know the most, the most important reason for her, as far as I'm concerned, was a spiritual reason. I wonder if you have ever asked yourselves, when she prayed that prayer, why was it that she did not ask God to give unto her a daughter? When she prayed that prayer, she specifically asked God to give unto her a man-child. I think there was a spiritual truth involved here. You see, year after year, she came to the temple of God with her husband. Year after year, they came to worship God. And my brother and sister, year after year, she was so much aware of the sin that was going on at the very doorpost of the temple of God. She was aware of the sons of, of Eli, who was living in blatant sin in the very temple of God. And year after year, as she entered into the temple of God, did she sense the tremendous sense of need when it came to the spiritual state of the people of Israel. And she came to the place where she said, God, if you will give unto me a man child, she said, then will I give that child back unto thyself. 
I wonder tonight, my brother and sister, if you and I know anything of this incredible sense of the burden of God. You see, she carried a burden, and that burden was a spiritual burden. It was not so much a fact that she did not have children of her own, but it was a burden for the cause of the people of Israel. And she prayed that prayer to God for a specific reason. Now, I'm constantly challenged as I read in the history of uh, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I discover now and again that God in His sovereignty and His mercy brings a burden to someone. And when God gives that burden to that person, He calls that person to seek the face of God. And my brother and sister, that one person find the ability and the strength from God to carry that burden through when it comes to the responsibility of prayer. A number of years ago, I was speaking at a, a conference in South Africa. And, uh, it was a sort of a camp, a camp meeting. Uh, we call it camp meeting conventions in South Africa. And uh, the people were against slavers. And the meetings was in a large thing. And I discovered that in that specific place, were about 50 people with the same name. Say the name was Watson. It was a, Watson, it was a Dutch name, a Dutch name, Nibo. And uh, all those people knew the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. And I was very interested to find out how these people got saved. In fact, the first night of the meeting, I said to them, folks, uh, when we switch the lights up tonight, and you bump into someone this night, just say, I'm sorry, Mr. Watson, because there were so many at that specific camp. But I was tremendously interested to find out how those people got saved. And this is what they told me. About 23 years ago, two of our workers in the faith mission in South Africa went to that specific town in the Western Cape to do a series of special evangelistic meetings. They said when they came into this little town of Clan William, the moment when they uh, began with the visitation and invite people to these meetings, they began to sense a tremendous sense of the burden and uh, the passion and the sense of the presence of God. And they knew that something was going to happen during those meetings. In fact, they told me that the first night of the meetings, uh, the place was absolutely packed. Those two girls who had conducted that, uh, that series of special meetings, uh, the first night they were too afraid to open their Bibles. They were too afraid to open their hymn books because of the awesome sense of the presence of God. And from that first night, the Spirit of God began to break into the meetings, and during about three weeks or so, close to 400 people were swept into the kingdom of God. And they could not understand that it was almost like a breath of revival. But every night in those meetings, there was an elderly man in his early 80s who sat at the front, with his head bowed as they were preaching the Word of God. One day, one of those workers said to the other one, maybe we should go and visit this old man and ask him why he said that God is working in such an incredible way. You know, if they went to see this old man who was living, uh, living uh, in a little cabin in what we would call the Cedar Mountains and that part of Southern Africa. And when they spent time with him, they began to discover that he was one of the most choicest saints of God. And they turned to him, they said, sir, can you tell us why he said that God is working in such an incredible way? And the old man began to share with him something of what was upon his heart. And this is what he said. He said, you see this town? He said, this town is divided by a kind of a hill. He said, one part of the town is on this side of the hill, and the other part of the town is on that side of the hill. And this is what the old man said. He said, every morning, he said, I walk across to the other side of the town. And he said, there is a place where I kneel, and I look down to this part of this town, and he said, I pray for this part of the town. Then he said, I cross the hill, and there was a rock where I kneel. And he said, every morning I kneel at that rock, and every morning I look over that part of the town, and he said, I am buried in my heart before God. And those two girls realized that they were on holy ground, and they became so broken in the presence of God that eventually... One of them turned to the old man and said, Sir, would you allow us to ask you, how long have you been doing this? And the old man could hardly get his words out. But he sort of controlled himself and he said this, 